Okay. The lab exam has been written and uh, vetted by Beatrice, and uh, we've gone through all the answers, and we both took the exam and got the same answers except for one question, and uh, we then reached agreement on that question. Um, but uh, for the most part, the exam's uh, ready to go, and so she, by attending, okay, so by attending Beatrice's review session, maybe, uh, you know, you might accidentally get insight on the exam because, you know, that, that sort of thing might happen. Um, let's see. I want to put some notes up. Uh, remember that you're going to have your, uh, your summation report will be due the last day of lab, okay? Okay, there's a rubric. There's a rubric uh, posted on BSpace. Okay, please don't say that you don't know how to do this two-page report and then email your poor GSI the night before because if you read the rubric, you'll know how to do this report. Okay, and uh, summation reports due. Okay, and then so people are asking about experiment 12 and the post lab. Um, the post lab is due at the end of class. Okay, at the end of lab session. Um, but you know, if, if you really do need a little extra time because you're crammed at the end, I'm sure you can hand it to your GSI a little bit later. That's fine. I'm allowing some leniency there since it, you know this may, may be hard to get finished at the end. Okay, and then our lab exam. Our lab exam is coming up. Um, that's May 2nd, 7 to 9 p.m. Okay, this is the last ditch chance for people that uh, did not did not heed uh, the um, uh, my uh, uh, my prompting for uh, those that need to take the alternative exam. And uh, some people come in at very 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 last minute. And I just want to say that um, you'll be lucky if you're accommodated if you are, are asking me for a late to doing an alternative exam now because the rooms are being set. The people that are doing this are extremely busy with multiple courses, and uh, you were supposed to do this a long time ago. I know some things came up later, but um, it's it's put a little bit of stress on the system. So please make sure that you're going to take the exam if you can't be there May 2nd, 7 to 9. And the excused absences for that, of course, are approved by me. And uh, those are sports and uh, dance or other Berkeley like orchestra type um, activities. Okay, not because mom and dad are coming to town or something like that. All right. Um, so we have this sort of seemingly, you know, we have this uh, uh, extra. It seems like a little bit of extra lecture here for the light lab. And I decided I would go into a little more detail about molecular orbitals and electronic transitions that are, of course, very important um, for how molecular systems interact with light. And so this is beta carotene here um, that gives carrots their orange color. And remember, a carrot's orange because it absorbs very strongly the beta carotene pigment in the blue, uh, cyan, violet range. Okay, and the structure within beta carotene that's responsible for absorbing those visible photons is this conjugated pi system, okay? So there's a conjugated pi system. And what is a conjugated pi system? Conjugated pi system is where every other bond in a big chain, in a chain, are basically single uh, double bonds, okay? So we go like double bond here, single bond here, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. You can see as you're going along here, we have a massive, a massive chain of double bonds and single bonds in a big, um, we call it conjugated pi system. And that, that allows for electrons you know, well, that's a big point. That allows for electrons. That allows for electrons to move in a coordinated manner along this um, conjugated pi system. Okay. So these electrons can move all the way down this pi system, and when they move, of course, they'll be left with a partial, a positive charge here on this carbon. Let's pick up a proton, and you'll end up with an extra pair of, of electrons there and a negative charge on the other end. And in reality, you never really see this species, or you never see the species as drawn here in an organic chemistry textbook like this. It doesn't look like that at all. Those electrons are actually constantly in flux, moving along the conjugated pi system in a giant, we call giant molecular orbital. Okay. So if you look at this. Um, and it's kind of a funny thing to do, because uh, we're going to look at this molecule on its side, which, as you know, it's going to be very thin, um, because it's a planar molecule, largely. There's a, there's a few things here on the end. There are these, um, there are these uh, methyl groups here that are popping off the ring. But this is an edge view, OK? This is an edge view of beta carotene. And the reason I'm drawing an edge view is because, remember, that your conjugated pi cloud uh, here, uh, I'll use this. It's going to be above and below, OK? So you'll see this pi cloud above and below the plane, the plane of the um, beta carotene, OK? So this is a half. This is half of the uh, molecular pi, pi uh, molecular orbital, and this is the other half. Okay. And the key thing for absorbing visible light is that you need to have, as you see, very large conjugated pi systems to absorb visible light. Okay. If it's a very small system, say with just a few double bonds in it, double bond, single bond, double bond, it's going to only absorb down in the UV. Okay. But in order to see these vis vis visible pigments, which are now becoming popular in all kinds of you know green commercial products, um, because people want natural dyes in their products. Um, and if you want you know, visible ones, you're going to need large conjugated pi systems. OK, so, yeah, so essentially what happens is, is because this view on the top here with the line bond drawing doesn't really exist, the electrons, the electrons are effectively delocalized. Okay? The electrons are delocalized. And that means these electrons are you know, moving all along. Well, there's multiple different configurations here, energy states. But they're moving along this large conjugated pi system. And, and I'll do an example that's much simpler than beta carotene. Uh, we'll do uh, benzene to think about that. So the key features, again, are alternating single and double bonds. And um, delocalization, pi electron, these pi electrons. And of course, there's no static, there's no static bonding configuration. Okay. So this has been, you know, like I said, with something like benzene, people have argued about how benzene looks. So does benzene look like this? Does it look like this? Well, those are both consistent line bond notations for benzene. But probably, you know, the correct drawing is something like this, where these benzene electrons are actually delocalized, okay? There's six 
high electrons in benzene, and they're delocalized around the ring. Okay, so that's probably the best way to draw it. But um, we we draw molecules in all sorts of configurations. Um, right. So let's even back up to something far simpler. Here's ethylene. So ethylene is a has a single a double bond between two carbons, and what we want to think about here is what we mean by pi bonding, and then we'll contrast that with what we mean um, in terms of anti-bonding. So essentially, what you'll have is you'll have your you'll have your molecular you'll have your orbitals here. These are your p orbitals. If you have bonding, now these these orbitals have a phase to them, okay? And I'm I'm going to emphasize the phase by shading them both in the upward configuration. So these molecules, the shading the shading indicates phase. This will become very important when you have larger conjugate systems like in benzene. Okay, so when, the, when, when p orbitals, so these are p orbitals for now. So these p orbitals um, are in phase. And when they're in phase, then they can um, contribute constructively to making a pi bonding orbital. Okay? So when they contribute, contribute constructively to make this, um, this orbital, it looks something like this. Now, I've left out the sigma bond. There's going to be, of course, a nice sigma bond here between, the, I'll do it in blue. There's going to be a nice sigma bond here between, there's a nice sigma bond between the carbons. Okay, and that's where your s orbitals are going to overlap constructively, so that's a sigma bond. And then where your um, your p orbitals overlap constructively, they'll overlap above and below, above and below the plane of, and I'll shade the top just to keep the phase similar. So this is one half of the pi bonding orbital, and this is the other half. Okay. Now this is for a double bonded molecule, but imagine if we had a C-C triple bond. Where would we put? We put two more uh, pi, half pi bonds in there. Okay. Does anybody know where they would go? Does anybody know anything? About yeah, so they go orthogonal to these, okay, 90 degrees to these. So I can't draw that very well, but um, you can use your imagination. And, and so, again, yeah, like, like was said here by the gentleman in front and back of the carbon carbon sigma bond, okay? So um, the, key, the key points here is that a bonding orbital, a pi bonding orbital is in phase, okay? So by, by meaning in phase, what we're saying is, is that, you know, those, those original p orbitals, those original p orbitals were aligned, they were in phase, okay? So they can contribute constructively. Uh, the p orbitals can um, interact constructively, okay? Now a lot of this sounds like, you know, the kinds of things you hear about when you study light in physics class, and you talk about destructive, uh, constructive and destructive interference. Same idea, okay? And um, I made the analogy on Wednesday, when you um, have a jump rope and you say, I don't know if anybody's played with a jump rope in this manner, maybe I only did this when I was a kid, but um, bear with me. So you tie, tie a jump rope to a doorknob, and you, if, you, if you move it really slowly, um, you'll see one wave, and if you shake it a little harder, you'll see nodes and so forth and so on. Well, this kind of thinking is very appropriate to thinking about how these orbitals are gonna interact, okay? So what you'll see when you shake that rope very hard, when you see multiple nodes, is actually something that becomes less of like a bonding orbital, a pure bonding orbital, which is just a single, single wave between two points, okay, just nodes on the end, essentially, versus when you shake it harder at a higher frequency, then you'll see these nodes. And now your jump rope is going into a higher energy state, okay, and it will, in the bonding world, take on anti-bonding character. So you can see as, it, as you elevate the energy of this jump rope system, you can see it becomes less and less stable in a bonding sense, all right? So anyway, um, and of course, these pi bonding electrons reside above and below, above and below, the sigma bond, okay? And um, generally, generally, almost always, I shouldn't even say generally, generally pi, the pi bonding, the pi bonding orbitals are more stable than the original um, p orbitals, okay? So, you know, what do we mean by that? Well, we have these original p orbitals, and these guys have some energy here, okay? And when they form a pi bond, the pi bond is lower in energy. When they form the anti-bond, you'll see they're higher in energy. This is me trying to make a jump rope analogy. The, the anti-bond is going to have more nodes, be higher in energy than the original p orbitals, and pi bond is much more stable. Um, so pi bond, you know, when molecules form, okay, so when molecules form between, uh, in, you know, during chemical reactions, generally as bonds form, like these bonds, they're going to be lower in energy, so they're going to release heat, right? You're going to release energy in the process. So that should hopefully make sense. Okay, so that'll lead us to anti-bonding. So in anti-bonding, by contrast, the, um, the electrons are forming out-of-phase orbitals, okay? Out-of-phase orbitals that overlap, that overlap destructively, okay? Okay, and we denote, we denote these as pi star for people who haven't been paying attention. And again, again, these pi stars reside, you know, above, above and below the sigma bond. Okay, and, um, you know, and then these pi star antibonds are higher in energy. Than the original p orbitals, okay? And I just told you that. Okay, so let's, let's imagine what they look like. So you have your original uh, p orbitals, they come in, and something's awry, they're out of phase, okay? Okay, these are out of phase. And these guys will, you know, these guys will form, these guys will form 
antibonds, pi antibonds, it looks something like this. Now, you know, I, I, I don't draw this as well as textbooks. But they'll look something like this. You can see these electrons are out of phase and destructively interfering with one another. And there's a nodal plane between the two. Just like when that jump rope hits high energy, that node, so here's your, your pi star, half of a pi star here, half of a pi star here. And this is a node plane here. This is a node between these, okay? It's a much higher energy situation. In fact, your electrons are not uh, forming nice connected molecular orbitals. High energy situation, there's a node in there, okay? That is an antibond. And so, you know, you might say, well, you know, what, what's happening in this, um, this energy diagram for ethylene? Well, you know, you have your P electrons here, the original P electrons. How many, how many P electrons are we talking about? How many, how many P electrons are involved in this pi bond? Two, no, no, we're talking about ethylene here. Two, right? And so when you have your pi and your pi star, in the stable state, these two electrons are gonna populate the pi bond, right? They're gonna form just a nice pi bonding interaction. Everything's hunky-dory, they're in a low energy state. They're not, they're not excited electrons at all, okay? It's not until they interact with light or something else um, that they get driven up to the uh, anti-bonding high energy state and then populate that uh, node, node, um, nodal structure I showed you there. Okay, so now we'll do benzene, which is much more complicated and, and you know, it just helps us learn what's going on. And ultimately we'll connect this to light and then you'll see the light. Uh -huh. All right, so we have our original P orbitals. Now how many, how, many, how many P electrons are in a benzene ring? How many P electrons are we talking about around those carbons? You can cheat. Somebody in the front row is cheating. He's looking ahead. Oh, <laughs> there's six. Okay, there's six electrons in there. And all right. And so the low energy state of our benzene is going to look something like this. And if we're going to do this sort of nice drawing, which is kind of hard to do, I embarrass myself by trying to do it. Um, so you'll just have to follow the shading. It's all above the ring. This is a low energy state. Okay, these guys are all in phase. So we got six. We got all six. Um, all six electrons um, in phase. So these are going to form nice pi bonds. You know, these black lines are um, nice pi bonds above and below the ring. And, and what, one, what one might say here is that we have, this is basically 100% pi bonding character, okay? Okay, that's the most stable. Um, I shouldn't even use a star because that's kind of confusing. To say this is the most stable configuration, okay? So there we go. We'll put a line under that to mark that as the low, the low energy state. This is where it gets a little crowded. So now we're going to go up in energy. We're going to go up in energy some. Yeah. So how many electrons can I put down there in that bottom configuration? How many electrons fit in an orbital at all times? Max two, right? So let's, let's populate our orbital. There we go, there's a nice pair of electrons. So now we're down to four, but luckily we have, um, luckily we have two more orbitals that are still, they're still actually pretty stable relative to the original P orbitals, okay? So we're not gonna cause any quantum mechanical explosions. All right, so in this, in this case we have, um, basically we'll put half the molecule in the same phase and half the molecule in the other phase. Okay, so how many nodes does that have? How many nodes do you see? Because there's two nodes around the ring, effectively. Okay, we can pop two more electrons in there. Two more electrons can fit in that guy. And then we have another one which has um, half the molecules in one phase and half the molecule is in the other phase. Now this is kind of an interesting case where the nodes are on these carbons, okay? Right on top of the carbons. So this is another um, stable configuration that can take another pair of electrons. And again, we have in these cases two nodes, okay? Zero nodes down here, most stable, two nodes. So on your jump rope, now you've, you've gone sort of an intermediate sort of undulation there. I'm gonna run out of room. <laughs> Uh-oh. I have, hold on a second, I'm gonna do magic. I know you can't do this on your paper. I can do it with my mouse. Let's see. I don't know how, how. Oh yeah, watch this. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, back to 100 percent. Okay, yay. Okay, so now we have room to do the next two. Okay, black, black. Okay, these guys are gonna be higher in energy. Okay, so oh, before we leave the two nodes, do you think these guys have a little bit of anti-bonding, right? So these guys are not pure bonding orbitals. They have a little bit of anti-bonding character to them. Okay, so you can see the more and more anti-bonding character you take on, all right, a little bit, a bit of anti-bonding character. Okay, so now we're gonna go to the next, the next level. Okay, and now we're gonna be um, looking, looking pretty um, anti-bonding. We're not quite fully 100% anti-bonding yet. 